Good morning. I hope you all had a, a Merry Christmas overall. Well, maybe like Clark Griswold sitting up in his freezing attic watching old family videos, your Christmas was full of fond memories that you can remember back to. Uh, maybe, maybe this Christmas was once again a little discouraging just because of what's going on and around the world. I just want to encourage you to, to hang on and to, and to keep, keep fighting through this. We will, we will overcome this one day and, and look back and hopefully smile a little bit. Uh, but over the course of this series that we've been going over, this, this Christmas season 2021, we've been talking about time travel quite a lot. Maybe too much. Maybe too much for some of you. Sometimes I, I laugh at myself when when I'm writing these sermons, but I came across something this week that I just had to share because the, the, the bots and the algorithms that exist out there that help to uh, entice us when we're online or, or to narrow in on, on advertisements that we should be looking at must have been looking at my, my search history or maybe even listening in on, on my, my cell phone microphone or something like that somehow because they know. They know I've been been either searching for or talking about Back to the Future maybe a little too much, and they also know that I've been talking a lot about the nativity of Christ and, and his birth, because when I logged online this week, this was the picture that came across <laughs> my screen. This was the picture that I was suggested to view, and if you can't immediately tell what that is, Yes, that is a DeLorean time machine from Back to the Future crashing into some sort of stable structure housing Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And uh, just a quick side note uh, for those of you who have heard some of my other messages during this series, those are the exact same figures that my Nana had um, in her nativity scene that I used to play with that the G.I. Joes would enter into. Um, so I just thought that was pretty cool too. Uh, but like I said last week, just looking at this photo, there are zero shepherds. Once again, these guys are just overlooked time and time again. I mean, there's, there's no shepherds to be found. The cows and the donkeys, they get more uh, exposure than the, than the shepherds do here. Uh, but I digress and have already kind of gone off track here this morning. So where do we go from here? Well, the way that we're going to tie this picture into the, the sermon series that we've been in for the past couple weeks now is we're going to notice who else is in this picture. Okay, if you look in the back, I know it's kind of small. It was poor resolution in, in their little advertisement for me, but it's the Magi. It's the Magi. And some call them, some call them wise men. Some call them kings. Those men that you see in the back of that stable, all wearing crowns, those are the guys that we will explore here this morning as we round out this series. So this morning we do conclude our sermon series, First Century Christmas, and we've talked about how everyone loves a white Christmas. We didn't get it. Uh, I guess not here, at least. I know that some other parts of our country did, but uh, we all love our decorated Christmas trees. We all love our, our, our Christmas traditions, uh, a warm fire to gather around. But we all know that the, the things that we do during the Christmas season don't necessarily tell the full story or the full context of the birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago. The, 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 the traditions that we have, it's good to know where they come from, and they hold much value in our hearts and our minds, but the, really the full point of this series has been to, to look through all that and get to the, the heart of the context in the first century in which Jesus was born. Last week, we, we went back uh, to that first century. We, we, we jumped in our, our little proverbial time machines to explore and to encounter these guys called the shepherds. That was their vocation. They were out in the fields. They were overlooked by society. They were kind of pushed aside by, by their culture, and they were considered strangers and wanderers most places that they, they went. They were not trusted normally, from what we historically know, by men. They were not trusted by men, but as we found out, they became entrusted by the Lord God on that wonderful day. Yes, God entrusted them to be the very first witnesses of the birth of Jesus, as well as 
uh, essentially the very first evangelists going through the, the town and, and telling people the wonderful news, spreading the good news that will bring great joy to all the people, like we said last week, from pastors out in the field shepherding their sheep to preachers of the word, shepherding the people. And remember, this was set against the background of the, the very powerful, the very mighty Roman Empire. This message was not first entrusted to someone as powerful as Caesar. This message was not first entrusted to someone who oversaw Syria like Quirinius. Now, this was a message for the humble. This is a message for the ordinary human being. This is a message for all people, for you and for me and for everyone who has ever lived. And we can put ourselves in the shoes of these shepherds. Because it, remember, like I said, if there's anyone that we could truly relate to, it's those guys. Just the, the regular, ordinary person. This morning, like I mentioned earlier, though, we are going to pivot and we are going to focus on these, these guys, the, the magi. Like our previous encounters, I want you to again, uh, in, in your minds, get in whatever time machine that you like the most, whatever is most appropriate for you. Uh, However, while you're in your time machine, unlike this photo that, that, that's on the screen of the DeLorean crashing into the nativity, I want you to realize something. This is not what it looked like, first of all. And second, that the Magi likely were not there in this stable or this cave or wherever Jesus was born. We can't pinpoint exactly when, but many scholars assume that the Magi actually showed up quite a bit later around maybe even two years later. Uh, but there is no exact knowledge of exactly when, when they were there. But based on Herod's reign and, and Herod's life span, that's where scholars kind of start to gather some information as to when could they have possibly arrived. So once again, like I said, jump into your, your time machine of, of choice and, and mentally come with me back to the first century. And we will explore today, like I said, the visitation of the Magi to the house of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Let's read Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. All right, this morning let's address first, just right off the bat, the, the Magi. Before we touch any of the, the surrounding story or the, the context uh, next to it. Magi, who are these guys? Well, thanks to Christmas songs like We Three Kings of, of Orient Are and, and m many of our other uh, Christmas decorations such as nativity scenes and, and things of that nature, they usually portray them as, as, as kings or, or three guys wearing crowns or three guys who just look royal in, in, in nature. Some traditions even go as far as to, to naming them and, and uh, speaking to exactly what provinces in, in the east they, they came from. Scripture just doesn't tell us that information. But when we get, give ourselves just a plain look at Scripture, when we just read it as it is, we see that we don't have any of those details at all. So many of those things are assumptions or just historical details that were added uh, by others later on. But we don't, we don't know how many magi there are. We three kings, we don't even have a number. We don't know how many arrived. We don't know their names. We don't know any sort of royal status. We don't know what, what country that they originated from or anything of the like. Yes, later we're told that there were three gifts but the amount of gifts do not determine the amount of, of visitors. Uh, but regardless of tradition, what the scripture gives us and what really only Matthew gives us is the vis visitation of these guys called the Magi. The term Magi, it only appears in the New Testament six total times, four times right here. So this is the, the large chunk of it uh, here in Matthew chapter 2 and then just two times in Acts. Acts chapter 11, uh, they're both there. Uh, the Greek term is magos, which just means uh, magian, 
magi or magician. Uh, and, and in Acts, it's actually a variant, which means sorcerer. So that's, that's pretty cool. But both uses of the, of the term actually refer to what they do for a living, what their vocation is, what, what their, uh, their, their life is what their lifestyle looks like. Uh, magician, in Matthew's case, also uh, astrologer, those who study the stars, and, and by implication, also a type of magician, uh, the Magi are. Magi were usually very prominent people in the religious, uh, the religious life of whatever country that they were from. Uh, the reason, I guess, that we kind of, through tradition, see them as kings is because they would often hang out with uh, royalty in order to help them make decisions, religious decisions, uh, astrological decisions, and things of that nature. And we, we just know from Matthew that they're just somewhere in the Far East, somewhere off, although we don't know exactly where. But Magi use their, their knowledge of, of astrology, uh, and, and they, use, yeah, they used it in political diplomacy, religious, uh, magical incantations, and, and other things of, of that nature. So that's kind of a snapshot of the, ma the, the magi and what that word and what that term means. But I also want to note that these practices are quite distinct from maybe sorcery or evil magic, you could call it, found elsewhere in Scripture. So when you think of magi, I don't want you to think of like Pharaoh's magicians who we looked at briefly in our reclamation series a little while back, uh, because as scripture kind of points, Pharaoh's magicians use magic, but they also used secret arts. And secret arts aren't talked about here with the Magi. But nevertheless, the Magi, they come from the east, and they're here in Jerusalem because of a sign that they saw in the sky. And with their mixture of influence, remember these guys are pagans, their knowledge of, of paganism and astrology and even some knowledge of the Jewish scriptures, they have come. They have arrived, and their goal is to worship the one who was born the king of the Jews. Now, I think it's important to note that I believe it's highly doubtful that the Magi knew to come to worship Jesus as God in the flesh, God incarnate unless they received some sort of special revelation beyond what they uh, voiced, I don't think that they knew that it was God in the flesh. They were simply there following the prophecy of Scripture to worship the, the king, the king. Rather, they were, like I said, there to worship the king of the Jews. In a way, and in, maybe it's, it might sound goofy, the Magi were arriving essentially thinking that they were going to happen upon a royal baby shower. A royal baby shower to celebrate the birth of the king of the Jews. So when they came and they approached where they thought a king would likely be, they were surprised that it wasn't the case. In ancient times and even times today, leading people from other countries paid their respects to new kings, to, to babies born within royalty uh, in any sort of ruling country. The Magi have come to do just that, to give their respect and their honor to the child Jesus as prophesied uh, in, 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 in Scripture. And in their journey, like I was saying, they, they stop in Jerusalem because, of course, that's where the baby should be in their mind, to announce their arrival to, and, and to find the one born as future king. But Jesus is not the typical earthly king, as we would, we would call him, and he's not found to be in Jerusalem, and he's not found to be in the house of Herod. So let's read. Let's continue. Matthew 2, 3 through 6. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. The Magi bring news that essentially 
it, it, it freaks Herod out. Uh, he does not expect this. Um, Herod is always kind of weary, uh, historically, of the East. Rome does not, does not, um, has not conquered the East, so he does not necessarily feel safe for things coming from the East. So this, uh, uh, in, in combination with what he is hearing, sends him into panic mode, you could say. And these magi, they didn't really have anything to do with it. They, they innocently arrive in Jerusalem just ex with their gifts, expecting to, to come to the, the house of power and to, to visit the, the newborn, looking for a place to, to set down these, these gifts, when they accidentally, essentially, spill the beans uh, to the already paranoid Herod. I heard a story uh, growing up about a surprise party that was planned in my family uh, for my grandparents' anniversary, and, and friends and family for all, from all over the country uh, were invited to come celebrate, as well as uh, the local neighborhood. Uh, they were pretty uh, close to their neighbors, and my nan and pop were taken out of the house, kind of coaxed out of the house to go eat at a restaurant, and uh, while they were gone, their house was being prepared without their knowledge. And guests were beginning to, to fill the rooms, to, to jump out and, and surprise them when they got home. And after dinner, they, they, they drove home, and, and while they were pulling in the driveway, a couple neighbors were walking down the driveway as well. Uh, and they were caught, essentially, in, in, in the yard next to the house. And those neighbors had to quickly come up with a reason as to why they were just roaming around my nan and pop's house. And my nan is... Uh, she, she's very, she was a very trusting person, so she quickly just believed them that there was a neighborhood party nearby and that they were kind of just walking through their yard to, to get to it. And it didn't ruin the anniversary party, but it very well could have, uh, quite easily, actually. Those, in a way, those haphazard neighbors remind me of the Magi, just kind of like innocently walking to the party, not thinking anything's wrong, but then kind of throw things uh, for a loop. Strolling into town, albeit a little late, looking for the party, looking for the king, looking for the one born, the king of the Jews. And their arrival in Jerusalem sets off a chain reaction. Herod isn't the only one who freaks out. Because remember, people are waiting for this, this plan and this prophecy of the coming Messiah to come to fruition. So when people start hearing murmurs that these guys from the east saw something, that these guys from the east are, are bringing something to the king, everyone starts to, to stir. And, and, and the, the ruling class begins to stir and to, to grip tight to their power, as well as those who essentially already had the invitation to the party, who already knew the scriptures and the plan and the prophecy foretold in, in the scriptures that they held dear. Now, Herod of all the people, really should have known better. He kind of looks a little goofy, in my opinion, when he's asking the, this question that should have already been at the forefront of his mind. This plan and these prophecies were, were by no means hidden information. This is stuff that people hung their lives on. People just waited in anticipation, with, with eager anticipation. Herod is greatly disturbed, though, and acts like he had no clue that there was, was even a prophecy about a Messiah who was supposed to come. So he reaches out to his chief priests, and they immediately just point him to, to Micah chapter 5 and say, yeah, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, of course. This is what we've been, been waiting on. This is the, what we've been told for hundreds of years and generations after generations. And this prophecy from Micah doesn't, doesn't help to calm fears in Herod's house, but rather it intensifies them. And we won't explore it today, but if you read past uh, what we're going to explore here this morning, past the Magi, you'll read uh, the news and, and, and the plan that, that, uh, that Herod kind of unfolds in, in this murderous rage as he'll seek to kill all the boys in Bethlehem, all the boys in the surrounding region of Bethlehem, two years and younger. When we read this, Hopefully it, it's disturbing uh, to you, and it's unbelievable to our ears that, that someone would be so bent on, on keeping their power that they would do such a thing, and it is indeed horrible, but in a way, 
if you're, remember, we're in the first century now. This isn't outside of Herod's character. This is horrible. This is terrible. But this is something that you would actually be able to see Herod doing without remorse. To the community who were, who were under Herod's reign, they were used to this terroristic type of leader. In fact, Caesar Augustus himself was quoted as saying that he would, quote, rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. This quote came after Herod killed multiple people in his family. Herod killed wives. Herod killed children because he was paranoid, thinking that they were after his throne. That's, that's just the, the type of guy he was, I guess. But, but, but here's the Magi, and they arrive here in, in Jerusalem, and they throw Herod into even more of a paranoid fury. And Herod, Herod tries his best, I, w- I would assume, to not show his cards. And he probably wins an Academy Award here for his acting skills, telling the Magi that, yes, I too would like to, to worship the king, so please tell me where he is so that I can go worship him. Let's read that ourselves in in verses 7 through 8. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, if you lived in the first century, you would know that Herod uh, didn't conquer anything to get his power. Herod was appointed the power and the title that he had. The Roman emperor gave Herod his power. He gave him the title of king of of Judea. He didn't become the king. He was handed this this title. And for the most people, most people you could say in Jerusalem, they didn't agree with that. I mean, they dealt with it, but they didn't say, oh, yes, our, our beloved king, Herod. No, they were not happy with this appointed ruler, and mostly because of his character and mostly because of his totalitarian uh, way of, of approaching the, the reign itself. Herod was, was just, he was a damaged person. He was, he was personally plagued with paranoia and suspicion and, and jealousy, and, and, and this was just a downward spiral that intensified even uh, towards his death. Um, I feel bad for the guy, but he, he was a, a, very damaged, a very damaged guy. If any of you have maybe seen uh, The Lion King, uh, when I think of Herod and when I think of Lion King and, and for some odd reason combine them, I think of Scar. I think of Scar. Scar, Scar knew the plan of the coming king. Scar was, was a paranoid guy. Scar attempted... A power grab. Scar tried to to kill, and he actually did kill, family members. Scar tried to kill the rightful heir of the throne. Scar's reign was that of terror and mistrust, and and people never really validated Scar's kingship because of all that. And I think you know what I mean by now, uh, so I'll stop talking about the Lion King. But thinking that he could fool the, the Magi in re- just coming back and say, hey, I, we found the baby. He's over here. Come on over and, and worship him. Uh, Herod attempts to, to use them as pawns for this, this evil plan of, of murder. I'm going to wipe this supposed king off the map. And Remember, the Magi are from, from the Far East. We don't know where, uh, but we can assume that they don't know the fullness of, of Herod's reputation. Uh, there was no internet back then or newspapers circulating all all around the world. So they likely believe him. They likely believe him. And and the reason I come to that conclusion is because we we see later that an angel was sent in order to change their minds. But Herod wants to keep this secret. Herod wants to keep all this stuff quiet, to squash any other possible uprisings that that would come from, from people being uh, excited and in a, in a tizzy a little bit from, from the Jews who are just waiting for that coming Messiah. So he allows, allows the Magi to just go on their way after the little secret meeting, expecting, of course, 
being the king, they will do what I say, and they will return to me and tell me the information that I'm looking for. Let's continue with verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Since Jesus' birth, Joseph and Mary have stayed in Bethlehem. And they are clearly uh, not in a stable. They're not in, in a cave. They're not in whatever dwelling that they originally gave birth to Jesus in. For Matthew tells us that they're in a house. They're in a house. And whether that new house is maybe the same family house that may be connected to the stable or adjacent to the cave, we don't know any of that. That's all unknown. But, but since this young family has stayed in Bethlehem and, and not returned to Nazareth, it, it, it shows to us and it implies to us that Joseph has kind of set up some sort of permanent residence. Maybe he's uh, continued to, to work with his hands in, in Bethlehem, maybe carry on some of the family, family work, and he has equipped a house for family life, equipped a, a proper home for someone with a family. Uh, no more couch surfing like you tried to do during a census. But the Magi are directed by the sign of, of a star which stops over this home, a beacon uh, that led the way. When I first started driving, uh, one of my favorite things to do was to just drive, just get in my car and, and just drive around for, for hours on end. Uh, video games weren't as cool as they are now, uh, so driving was, was, was the best thing to do. And when I started driving, gas was $1.09. So my, my little job at, at Showcase Cinema is for, for $5.25 an hour. Could essentially fund me driving around endlessly. A uh, dollar nine stretched a long way. Uh, but while driving around with my best friend, listening to music with, with the windows down on a warm summer night, which is probably one of my favorite things to do, we noticed something in, in the far horizon. And it was a beacon. It was one of those uh, searchlights that was kind of like waving through the sky. And it, reminiscent of, of Batman's signal, we wanted to know where it originated. What in the world is going on over there? And we want to find this out. We wondered what it could be. We wondered where it could lead. It, is, it a, is, it a, is it a cool party or something that, that we're not invited to? Or is it a, a cool event of some sort? What what in the world are they doing over there? So we had no clue and nothing better to do. Uh, so we drove over there. And uh, when we got there, uh, we were bummed. We were completely bummed because it was the grand opening of a furniture store. <laughs> the searchlight led us to a lousy grand opening of a furniture store. But un unlike my, my letdown at driving into that, that parking lot. The Magi are drawn to a great light, a star in the sky that leads them to something amazing, that leads them directly to Jesus himself. The Magi arrive in Bethlehem, and they enter the house, seeing Jesus there with his mother, and they bow down before him in reverent worship. This act of, of bowing down, this act of, of worship, this posture of worship brings to mind uh, just when Old Test in, the, in the Old Testament when uh, leaders of Gentile nations would come and visit the king of Israel and present to them as well. So I think without fully understanding it, without fully understanding exactly what they were doing in this moment, these, these pagan guys, these magi, bow down in reverent worship before the king, the incarnate God, the king, the God of all creation. And they provide gifts of, of, of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and, and we kind of 
We wonder what, what that is exactly. And even they, without fully understanding it, the Magi probably didn't know what they were doing. They were funding the future of this family by providing them with such rich gifts for the time, these rare spices, this rare precious metal. Who would, this family needed this stuff, not uh, to use in the typical fashion of, of, a, of a royal family, but instead for those who were about to experience exile, for those who were about to flee from Bethlehem because of what Herod was about to, to unfold, and head off to Egypt, this would, would fund them. This would sustain them. They would be able to sell items like these uh, since Joseph wasn't able to, to stay put and, and maybe work in the same way that he knows how to do. In, incredible. This morning, I ask you to take a step back, maybe for a moment. I want you to view the, the account of these, these pagans, the account of, of these magi, and I want you to see it not just as a story, a Christmas story, or not just something that kind of makes your heart feel warm when you look at the nativity set. I want you to see it as a story of God working and a story of encouragement in your life. These pagan men from the Far East, not just far, in, in terms of vicinity, these guys were far religiously. They were far spiritually from the one true king. And they are drawn by God himself. They are drawn by Jesus. On that first Christmas, Jesus came to be born in the flesh. God's desire was to get so close, so close to his people that he, in fact, became a person. And in doing so, God's plan to seek and save the lost became more intimate than we could ever fully fathom, more personal than we could ever truly understand. John 1.14 reminds us that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So as the worship team comes forward this morning, although Christmas, the Christmas season 2021 is over, may the, the, the actions and the motivations behind the Magi maybe guide our lives a little bit. These pagan people caught the truth. They caught the truth of God's word and they trusted it just enough to follow it, to follow it after it, wherever it might lead them. May we follow their example and seek after King Jesus in the same way, following him all the days of our lives. I mentioned this on Christmas Eve, but both Herod and the Magi went looking for Jesus, but only one truly found him. May we never tire in our pursuit of seeking out the company of our one true King, Jesus. And if you've never accepted Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, Messiah and King, and God is leading you to do so, will you respond to that call here this morning? Will you respond to, to Jesus asking you to accept him as Lord and Savior? being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and starting a new life, an eternal life in him. If that's a decision that's on your heart this morning, would you come forward as we all stand together?